Have you ever wondered if your company is maximizing the return of your data investment? Are you collecting the right data required to make informed decisions? Is there more that can be learned from our data? Koyas Institute can answer these questions and help you discover the hidden value within your data sets by utilizing a well-rounded approach to data analysis. Stop leaving value behind and start increasing the return on your data investment. The next generation of data analysis has begun. We are pioneers in pattern discovery. We are Koyas Institute. Okay, we've got an interesting talk ahead of us today, and uh, I think a lot of you will find the issues we discuss to be important and relevant to the current state of the UFO research field. So today I'm joined by Bruce Fenton and Jeremy Reese. It's great to have you guys on. Now, I know who you are, but if you could introduce yourselves and give a brief description of what you do, let's start with Bruce. Hi, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm a researcher of uh, ancient mysteries, anomalous phenomena, and human origins. I suppose those are my, my favorite areas. Uh, probably the last 20 years I've been involved in those kind of areas, obviously UFOs as well. And I've been featured on cable TV. So some people have seen me on Ancient Aliens or The Unexplained Files. And I've got a couple of books called The Forgotten Exodus, which is about human origins. And that's got forward from Graham Hancock and Exogenesis Hybrid Humans, which is more alien related, of course. And that's got forward with Eric von Daniken. So some people know, you know, know me from those kind of angles but yeah a broad interest in all things fringe strange and controversial it's great to have you on man and jeremy who are you and what do you do well i have a bachelor's degree in physics from bridgewater state university and uh i'm into all sorts of controversial scientific topics uh, mainly propulsion physics anti-gravity free energy those types of uh, things and I, and I research and keep databases on any kind of scientific information or papers and uh, anything related to that. I interview the scientists, try to get them to come on and talk to me and share, you know, information. We've tried to create a disclosure platform for technologies and, and scientists to sort of speak out and speak freely uh, if their information about these programs um, and open sort of windows into this world of top secret scientific research. And what we can pull out of it for the betterment of humanity as a whole. It's great to have you on, man. So we've got a pretty eclectic uh, collection here. It's going to be an interesting conversation. And I think it's a good time to have this conversation. It's relevant uh, in the face of the recent congressional hearings to discuss ways to move forward and to, I guess, politely critique some of the placation to government narratives on this issue. Um, I think to start off with, uh, I'd like to get both of your views on the current state of ufology, the current state of the research field. Uh, where are we succeeding? Where do you feel we're lacking? Um, Jeremy, why don't you kick us off with your thoughts about the current state of ufology in your pers in your perspective? Well, um, I think that there's programs that are being flaunted and promoted by a lot of you know, people in the mainstream media and also you know, people within the community as, as being, you know, the, the answer is that the government's going to finally open up and, and tell us the truth to this and, and give us answers. And the fact is that, um, you know, we see this new article, six whistleblowers apparently have testified before the, you know, uh, the Senate hearings and under behind closed doors. I, I went to the Senate hearings myself last week, uh, down in Washington, DC, uh, I spoke with Senator Gillibrand. She said that the number is closer to uh, 20, uh, nearly two dozen people, uh, she said, have spoken before. But uh, six specifically, I guess, related to, well, with knowledge of crash retrieval programs and uh, alleged like reverse engineering programs and stuff like that, which is what I'd be most interested in as a physicist studying this stuff. So I think that... Um, I have high hopes for that, you know, but I'm certainly not holding my breath with uh, what, you know, the government is capable of uh, as far as cover-ups go. And, um, you know, the, the scope of Arrow, the, 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 the scope of the intelligence that they're allowed to collect, that Title 50 limitation is a, is a big deal, as uh, a few people have pointed out. The Title 50 gives them access to only about 20% of the total intelligence data collection pool. Whereas, uh, you know, pro top secret programs like CIA, NRO, or other um, top secret operations that might be involving e either craft or things that give the illusion of craft, 
um, could be operating and they wouldn't have the intelligence on those. They wouldn't be given the intelligence on any of that stuff. So I think there's a big debate going on whether these things are man-made um, or whether they're extraterrestrial and that the alien uh, cover is alien thing is just a cover story for man-made technologies. Um, I'm not going to take sides in that debate either way. I'm just going to try to look at case by case uh, evidence and evaluate uh, case each case at its own face value and try to find answers um, individually. But uh, that's kind of the current state, and I think I think that we're seeing a, a good a. a positive shift towards a lot of people realizing that science and scientific tools of analysis are our best friend and are, are crucial in uh, the understanding, interpretation, and communication of the, uh, this information and and verification of the information as well because uh, you need to be able to replicate the, what people are seeing in order to explain it. And I think that's, that's super important in, on the technology side. Uh, that a lot of these programs are now being opened up. It's it's caused NASIC apparently that Friday after the hearing on Wednesday, that Friday NASIC held a uh, a top secret emergency hearing at, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And several of our intelligence uh, leaders basically sat down and reevaluated, you know, how we keep secrets. See, a lot of them they they had this whole reevaluation of of the whole NASIC security chain and everything, and I thought that that was uh, interesting. It, it it could mean transparency, but it, it could mean concealment. Thing is, if there are these technologies, and we have pieces of off world technology that contain you know futuristic you know what 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 would essentially amount to a quantum leap in technology. Um, the value that you be able to put on something, the business value, I mean, private investors or private interests, this is like the theme to like so many bad movies uh, I, I, you heard of where it's like the billionaire finds out about the, the alien technology and wants to have the monopoly over it and control over it. So, so finding out who in the chain of this command would stand to benefit or, or stand in a position to sort of, uh, you know, keep this from the American people. Um, I can, you know, it's kind of a, a key piece of this puzzle, which I, I think is often overlooked on the disclosure side, people just looking to the government, um, not understanding that, you know, government has revealed itself to be so intertwined with the private sector and, you know, financial and economic institutions, uh, it's almost like a revolving door behind the scenes of um, finance, you know, and uh, and national security and and government. So, um, yeah, I think that I think that there's a, a bigger a bigger story here. I don't think that I, I have high hopes for you know these six whistleblowers um, and that there may be some something budging there behind the scenes but the fact that it's it's still under closed doors the public's not being told and there's people evaluating whether or not you know the children should be told or not um it's it's kind of troubling uh to say the least but yeah that's my assessment of the current state of, of, of affairs of things you have a whole bunch of these private interests working inside and outside of government in an effort to keep a lot of these technologies and other things under wraps for their own personal uh, benefits. And you also have, um, you know, interests of people within the government that want to bring disclosure or at least give the public the illusion that they care about disclosure and uh, are looking into these things. So, um, yeah, like I said, the, the, there's these private quasi-governmental organizations which have, I, I believe... The research has shown that the UFO file very early on, the late 1940s, early 1950s, went into these private entities, which are, you know, untouchable by FOIA. And this is a big reason why we can't get access to these these programs or the information out of them is because, you know, the government itself doesn't even have access. Presidents aren't briefed on this material. Um, presidents don't even have access. Even like top CIA people often don't have access to it because it's it's outside of it's outside of all that stuff. It's locked up in a, in a private, quasi-governmental 
nonprofit institute. Um, like Battelle Memorial Institute is, is one example that's been brought up. Um, they did a lot of metals research back in the late 1940s and 50s. I mean, they, a lot of top secret research for the government. They worked, they built the demon cores uh, for the plutonium bombs for the Manhattan Project. So they were involved in a lot of really high level metallurgy stuff, and, and they would have been a prime, you know, contractor pick for who you'd hire to analyze any kind of off world debris uh, should you come across something of foreign um, manufacture where you weren't quite sure where it came from or how it was made. These would be the people you'd send it to. Um, so it, it makes sense. Um, and then the, the fact that I questioned Sen Senator Gillibrand about Battelle at the hearings, you know, mentioned it by name. She, she had at least acknowledged it and, and asked for the spelling and so then joked that she was going to take a, a, a field trip, um, a road trip. Yeah. You know, she's like, oh, well, road trip, we can, let's go there. And, and the, one of the aides is like, they'd be, I'm sure they'd be happy to show you around. So, uh, it was almost like, um, almost too too perfect it felt uh in some ways it's it's like yeah it would be it, they could have it here and they could bring the senator right in and show her around and and she'd never know she'd never know that's absolutely right interesting perspectives man and we'll probably dig a little bit deeper into uh things like the patel memorial institute as we as we get through this because that's certainly like you said one of the kind of prime candidates for uh you know uh clandestine material acquisition and research and development with stuff that could be uh, off world and what about you bruce the current state of ufology how is it looking through your lens yeah i mean there's a, a few interesting things i should just follow a little bit on what jeremy said about the the corporate structure that's involved here because i mean today we live in a world where our trillion dollar holding companies really are, are holding the power you know above governments so if you look at, you know, State Street and BlackRock and these these enormous trillion dollar companies, you know, they are sitting kind of above, you know, the the AI companies, the tech companies, you know, the the weapons manufacturers, banks. So so you go say who has the power over say a really secretive development program? Is it the president of the US? You know, is it some English prime minister? Or or is it gonna be the board at State Street or something, you know, a company that can like you say, when these guys turn up and visit presidents and prime ministers they're treated as royalty because if they move their investments they can ruin your country i mean so that's the level of power now that these kind of these private interest groups have so i, I think we have to kind of be realistic and say that it's not a kind of disclosure that can happen just because politicians would want to bring out evidence of secret projects right this would have to involve these corporate interests and these you know, mega powerful people who kind of hide behind these companies right which realistically, there's only a you know, couple of thousand people in the world that are billionaires and you know hundred millionaires who kind of sit behind these holding companies, and that so their infighting in politics in that world is going to dominate what we see from these projects. You know, how many guys behind there? How many of these people are interested in bringing out transformative technologies, either for the good? of humanity or because they now feel that they can bring them out and utilize them for control of humanity either way they may have a reason to bring that out right or they may not but i i think we're going to see that that's going to be the deciding factor i don't have a lot of uh faith in the idea that senators or mps or any of those really are going to be able to get to this unless they are already being utilized to bring this out at the behest of private interest groups right so that, that's the first thing I'd say. The other, the other thing I find um, interesting, of course, is being a little bit older than maybe some of the people out there that are into the topic. There's still a lot of young people getting into this topic, of course. Is that, you know, I remember 20 odd years ago, 25 years ago, when ufology was really dominated by the kind of paranoia of the you know, shills and government infiltrators and disinfo agents. And, and of course, that's kind of still there to a degree, but we are at a point where it's almost that those are the people that are at the forefront now is the agents the insiders the the former disinformation agents and you know so it's it's quite a wild journey to you know to approach what seems to be something like an end game and finding so much of that landscape has shifted that we're now waiting on those very you know kind of insiders that were once being pointed at as you know as the enemy you know but now they're kind of the, they're becoming the heroes of disclosure uh that's quite amazing and you know we've seen in the last 
few days even, that some of the same people that are being looked to for UFO insider information are, are known to have lied, you know, recently in terms of things like Hunter Biden's laptop and all this. We're seeing these insiders who we're being told are going to help reveal UFO data, but yet it's it's well evidenced that they have lied in other matters involving the public, right? So I, I find that hard to square, and yet there's um, there seems to be a willingness to ignore the amount of lying that's gone on from many of the people that are now being looked to for disclosure. Not all of them, but there there is definitely some problems here. And I find that within our community, there seems to be a disconnect where an awful lot of people don't seem to see this topic as joined up to other things that are happening around the globe today. You know, there's a, there is a strange disconnect. Like, go back a few, a couple of years ago, I remember kind of touching on the fact that when we saw this movement towards uh, being able to uh, discuss UFO events in terms of the military, you know, witnessing UFO events, that we should also see that in the context of the looming drone war. I mean, because it, it seemed to be, again, a disconnect in the community of, of not wanting to say that, hang on, what has changed in the military environment? Well, you now have novel drones all kinds of novel drones. I mean, you can pretty much design a drone that looks like almost anything, you know, spherical drones, triangle drones, uh, you know, most of the shapes that are associated with an anomalous vehicles. You can replicate those forms in drones. Now, they might let's say do the incredible speeds or teleporting or anything that's super anomalous. But for the average person who's looking up at the sky, they would see some of these things and be you know, absolutely shocked. Now, the other problem with that, of course, is that if you've got soldiers at a base and a saucer flies over and they're unwilling to report that because they know historically their careers will be ruined. But that can be a Chinese drone, right? So all of a sudden, the benefit of kind of sweeping away the UFO, where it used to be an inconvenience, they said, you know, they had all these reports of UFOs. It was bogging down the system. They weren't really going to do anything with, you know, Farmer Joe's UFO report. They weren't very interested. They had an awareness there was anomalous things in the sky. They had an awareness as well that a lot of people just report, you know, Venus, clouds. So in the end, there were some decisions made that they weren't going to put a lot of manpower on that. And so they kind of, you know, they built up the stigma and that was useful at that time. But the stigma is now harmful because you can't really have, you know, your base commander being unwilling to call in a novel, you know, a novel Chinese drone because he's scared that you're going to say, you've gone nuts, you're seeing flying saucers. Right. So, so that Mike said is that people seem to have ignored this and said, you know, this is all about aliens. It's like, well, no, that's a, I think that's a, it's been a very naive take where we can see that, you know, we're already moving towards AI generals, uh, unending drone war, not only on Earth, but unending drone war in space, which is where they're kind of heading towards because it's the ultimate military grift is that you've got drones up there from China, Russia, America fighting each other in space that we can't really even monitor and all being told that endless production of drones you know needs to go on and that we all have to pour our money into this drone war so you can you can see how that direction suits a lot of the same interests that are using these technologies and they're hiding these technologies the same you know military industrial complex that's done this is now moving in a direction where it's useful for them to change this narrative and to bring out some of these technologies because of the direction of that kind of warfare and where this is heading so that's why I'm quite sort of skeptical that we should view any of that as being an organic change in how they want to engage with the public and to be more open and to you know give us transformative technologies. I, I take that as a very sort of a naive stance. You know, I'm sure there are good people, you know, in these networks who would like to bring out technologies for the good of humanity, but I don't think they're going to be in the senior positions. Very, very few of them who can actually influence this in a real way, right? So they could maybe do a whistleblower come out and reveal themselves it's a very dangerous choice they could do that but i think without a green light from above that's unlikely and at the moment i'm not seeing why that green light would be given in view of where we are going in this kind of drone war world right so that's that's my concern so you have this kind of this mixture and also of course in the last few years we've seen the absolute willingness of our officials to bareface lie on multiple topics, you know, whether in the US, the UK, across Europe, to stand a bareface lie on multiple important topics and be caught out without consequences. So 
is there really any incentive for them to suddenly turn a new leaf and start telling the truth? I'm not seeing it. I'm just not seeing it. I, I wish I was. So I feel that really ufology has to kind of take a step back and return more to the kind of the grassroots of, you know, the citizens trying to, you know, bring about a change in the paradigm rather than overly heavily leaning on the idea that, you know, you can write to your MPs and your senators or that, you know, there's a few brave people in there that are going to change it all. I, I, I wish it was that simple, but I'm not seeing it. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. Do you have anything to add there, Jeremy? Well, I just, uh, I agree. I agree with a lot of what, what Bruce said. Absolutely. Uh, especially good points on the military stance on why they've changed their tune now, why it's now become a hindrance on reporting potential uh, real, real-time threats. Um, by in the, in the lifting of the stigma, I think that's that's important um, because it, it shows. It, I definitely see that as what's going on in the military right now. Um, they're trying to lift that stigma. They're trying to open up the channels of reporting and um, also demystify these things, but also keep it under the stigma of that that it's it's it could be aliens and it's that's perfectly okay. And let's talk about aliens and, and not really talk about technology or, or, or these other kinds of things. Let's just leave it at that, which I think is um, is an interesting point as well, because the technology side of this and the science side of this seems to be left out of the, it's left out of the mainstream media conversation. It's left out of all the, the you know, Pentagon conversations outside of DARPA. So um, from what I've seen, you know, so, so it, I think that that's a key part of it is the, the key, uh, the key technologies in this, and I think that it's important to understand our power as as um, citizens. That you know, the government is comprised of people just like you and me. That you know, for charter, give themselves this uh, illusion of of you know power um, that we give back to them um, and reinforce when we we you know we rely on government disclosures, or we we say that we have to wait for the government to disclose in order to, as if they're admission to anything is somehow, um, you know, confirmation of truth, which very oftentimes them admitting to things, uh, it turns out that it wasn't the truth and, and it was a misdirection or, or deception. So it's really on us. And, and at the end of the day, the government looks to scientists for their answers. They hired J. Allen Hynek to head Project Blue Book, and he was a scientist. And I think um, the scientific method and what we're doing with science um, outside of academia and outside of the mainstream it is um, going to be a big part of this uh, this progress and this step. And I'm, and I'm glad to see more people engaging in science, more people becoming interested in science, and then more people from the scientific community um, starting to follow these ideas and think outside the box in terms of, you know, propulsion and energy technologies. Because if we, if we tell, uh, I, I just hate to say it, but um, we're, we're going to, we're going to end up like a, like a bacteria. Yeah eating its food supply and drowning in its its own waste um yeah so we need to uh we need to wake up soon uh to all this stuff and uh and also there's a lot to weigh in terms of uh you know these things being used for good or bad it's a, a lot of technology is a double-edged sword and i think um we have to also you know evolve as humans in our understandings of uh responsibility in the world if we're going to you know unlock or open that Pandora's box of new technologies that could, um, you know, like, just like the nuclear age, you know, quantum mechanics, it, it brought us cell phones and, and computers and, and communications technologies, uh, which are used for a lot of good, but it also brought us, uh, vision weapons and, you know, things like that. So it's, uh, it's again, a double-edged sword, but we have to, uh, we have to, these people in charge of these programs have to understand that, you know, at the end of the day, it's 18 year old kids with machine guns that are, are, are defending their freedom, um, on the front lines of this, you know, and we have to hand this stuff off to a newer generation and, uh, keeping it in the, in the confines of pockets of rich, greedy old men, isn't going to do anybody good, anybody, any good. It's, it's going to ruin us all, I think as a species, um, I think it, it's something that needs to be opened up and, and, and truly uh, shared. But yeah, technology is a huge part of that because uh, that's how we 
experiment and push the envelope on this stuff. And, and as I pointed out, um, technology sort of been stifled. Um, our ability to invent stuff's been stifled. The, the Mansfield Amendment is one thing that started that in the, in the uh, 70s. Yeah, an amendment to the bar. What funding can be provided for technological advancement? You know, outside the box stuff was basically shut down. They, you weren't allowed to, and you know, do research unless it was very, you know, specific and had you know very specific scientific oriented goals in mind. Um, versus you know exploration of our our universe, which can lead to greater discoveries sometimes than you know ones that are purely you know interest or in industry based. Um, so I think that that's a big step. I, um, also the, um, issue of Battelle Memorial Institute, you know, being, a, having managing contracts for all the national laboratories in the United States. So this quasi-governmental organization that's been accused of, you know, holding, uh, being a cover or front organization for the real government UFO file for the last seven decades, um, manages all of our national laboratories so all of our science all of our scientific discovery is basically <laughs> run through that same filter i mean if you're going to hide this stuff anywhere <laughs> it, it, that would be the umbrella to do it under and uh I, I think it's yeah it's again it's a much bigger task than you know these politicians i, I think he, he is well intended and and well meaning as they are uh, their intentions can only go so far when they're faced with this octopus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, that's it. It's, it's it's labyrinthian and it's so complex. And I don't I don't know if many people actually realize what you just said about Battelle Memorial Institute essentially having complete oversight over all of the national labs. When do you know when that has that always been the case? When did that happen? Yeah, I it, I just. Remember finding that on their website. So um, we just look up when exactly that took place, because yeah, because it's you know that's that's a that's a pretty concerning thing to to, to find out actually. You know, well, it's interesting because our national labs like Los Alamos is where the Manhattan Project took place, and and of course you know Battelle was hired as the con subcontractor to to build those demon cores for the Manhattan Project, but. Um, Los Alamos and, and all these other national labs, they actually have had a history of these holding companies that exist at the lab, and they're a, a special patent holding company. So that patents uh, that are applied for, which have classified nature, go to a holding company. So it doesn't go to the regular patent office, so they're not listed under the, the normal patent directory so that you know you can't find classified information just through searches or, or that the, the patent office doesn't get a hold mm. and then classified information. So this has been a sort of a practice that's been set up inside the, our national lab since, you know, the days of the Manhattan Project when they were first set up. Uh, and so I don't know exactly when and how this, uh, as of 2022, it says, so this is a recent thing, but, um, it was this neon network or national science foundation that they got in 2016 but yeah i don't know when exactly that happened but i know that there's been these organizations that sort of have existed as well within that infrastructure you know to scoop to, as a, a safety net or a scoop for for uh, classified patents so it's it's not a surprise, you know, whether it's under Battelle or whether it's under these sort of hidden patent holding companies that existed. There are these um, mechanisms in place to, you know, put a filter on what science gets released to the public and what doesn't. So it's important to be aware of uh, if you're if you're if you're looking for, you know, other people in the government might have the clearance to look in, you know, open those doors and and look under those carpets to see if they're you know, is a, a hidden UFO anywhere. Um, but, you know, I don't, you and me don't have the authority to do that. And, and hopefully with uh, a little luck it, it, and the nudge in the right direction, they might, uh, they might discover something or come across something. But again, I'm hopeful, but not, uh, you know, I, I'm more set on the long, on the long run where we're, it's going to be a, a longer mission of us trying to figure out this technology based on what we know. But uh, yeah, there are Navy patents. I mean, so 
So there are some um, technologies that are being looked into, which uh, I think is the right path. The, the, the U.S. Navy and others seem to be looking into technologies. So I think that the right path forward out of this, uh, as far as I see, is, you know, we can ask the government for answers all day, but they're only as, they're only as uh, smart as the questions we can ask them. So the real questions are in the physics and in the science and technology, and those are the questions that, you know, we're going to continue to ask on my channel, and and uh, hopefully um, you're getting me a platform to ask here and get more people to, <laughs> to ask those types of questions. So, um, but yeah. Um, so you both have kind of brought this up uh, a little bit, you know, there's, there's a, there is a, I think there's a fine line between activism and radicalism. And this is certainly prevalent in our world today, not only in our research field, but, uh, just in more general terms, there is certainly uh, a heightened level of tribalism and the enabling of radical ideologies, uh, from, you know, social to political policy, um, but this has seeped into the UFO community. I would say it is most prevalent on UFO Twitter, where you do find some very hardline, uh, quite radical personalities who don't want you to question the the government narrative or the people involved on an, in an official capacity in the push for discussion within Congress and the Senate. So, how how do you guys um, how do you feel about this more kind of hardcore demographic that? quite frankly, seem more than happy to attack and deplatform individuals who want to ask tough questions and, and view the government officials and narratives around this issue with a degree of skepticism, which I personally would say is uh, healthy um, to have a degree of skepticism. But others seem to view this as some form of a threat towards disclosure and can get very irate if you, uh, if you challenge certain individuals or narratives. So Bruce, what is your experience of this? Do you have any thoughts on the more, let's just say, radical activism within this field? Yeah, it's quite an interesting phenomenon, I think, you know, and obviously it is a uh, kind of a part of our times that you say we've seen a lot more group think and the, the leveraging of, I'd say, of divisions and the leveraging of, you know, obviously um, passions and dreams by people that know how to utilize uh, vulnerable people, I'd say. Not necessarily, and this is mean that they're particularly, you know, something wrong with the brain, but there are many people who have a vulnerability, particularly if there's something they really want to believe, right, or there's something they really want to know. Now, if you can give them the feeling that you can provide that, right, that that is a really, really nice juicy worm on the hook for them, right? So as long as you, if you understand what they want and you give them the sense and you can deliver it, you you can pull in quite a nice crowd to follow, you know, follow your cheers and push it down, right? And and that's what I think we have, we are seeing is this leveraging. Now, and we've got to remember that within ufology, there, of course, there are not only some very intellectual people, very intelligent people, but there are people with certain skill sets, you know, they're coming out of the military world, intelligence world, you know, and they do have an understanding of how to to utilize assets, right? And to convert assets. So, you know, so someone like what any of us, if you have a platform or, you know, you have access to other people, you know, you're a useful asset to convert because, you know, if, if they can get you on board with the idea that they're providing you something really good, you know, or the potential to access something really good, and you take that on board, that's going to start to filter through to your followers, to your network of researchers. So we, we can see the way this is being done. And I think something very professionally, an understanding of, you know, the psychology of, I don't want to say victims, but in a way, certainly marks. Um, and that, that's that been happening a lot in the last few years. And amongst that, there seems to be, I'd say, a few individuals that are almost like generals marshalling their troops as well that have kind of taken on these roles within this kind of subculture that they are, you know, calling upon everyone to activate when some, you know, event is coming up. Or there's some need to you know, contact your Congress or to get out there and bombard journalists. Things like this. I've seen calls to, you know, contact all the journalists now. Tell them, you know, X event is happening. Um, so this is really is happening. Don't forget Storm Area 51. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of an interesting one. That how many people suddenly jumped onto that. And a lot of those were not people that were very much involved with the UFO topic. And just the way that kind of mimetic virus of the idea of, you know, let's go and get the aliens that that spread really fast and a lot of people got very excited by the idea that you know maybe everyone's just going to run in there and they were going to find the aliens and so i mean we know that these kind of mimetic viruses 
they happen, they're real. We've seen a lot in the last few years, the idea that, you know, you can get groupthink, you know, leveraged quite quickly and in some cases quite radically. And I think, you know, we we definitely have seen that in the UFO topic. And, and as the media has begun to feed into this loop, that exponentially increases, right? Because you've got, you know, Fox, CNN, and, and you know, all these big networks have covered UFOs, it, it, certainly in a greater extent and more seriously than they had in the many years previous, right? After we had the 2017 kind of Navy videos, the, that's changed. So it's not that necessarily lots of new evidence came out, but the way the media was reporting on what was out there changed quite radically. And so suddenly people felt, oh, there's really something serious here. And so when they're offered a, a kind of an insider seat in that bus, you know, that, yeah, you're on the way to disclosure. And we know these people. We know these people are putting this in the news. And, you know, this is us with the disclosure team. You know, that's, that's certainly going to be appealing for people that are also seeing it on the news, you know, to feel part of that, that when they see CNN, you know, they can nudge their buddy and say, I know the people that got this on the news. I talked to them on Twitter. Um, and that is that is definitely a big part of this. And we live in a world where people kind of want a bit of, you know, notoriety to be noticed, to be part of the group. And that, I'm afraid, is a dangerous journey as well, because, of course, often that bus is going off a cliff, you know, and then the driver is not going to be there when it goes over because they know where it's going. Right. And there's all, we've already seen this with a few of these um, kind of projects that have happened. There's been people who've left the social media entirely. They've been left very depressed. You know, I've heard of horror stories of people that commit suicide over the fighting and stuff that goes on within kind of ufo topics and who feel you know that their lives have been very much derailed by having put huge amounts of focus into a topic where it didn't deliver what they expected and they were kind of abandoned by their heroes so yeah it's it's, it's a concerning trend and uh jeremy same question man how do you feel about the uh kind of uh, i guess more radical styles of activism that we're seeing prop up over the last few years well as i as i mentioned sorry to cut you off but i just couldn't help the uh throwing that comment about the raid area 51 uh mess that went on there um yeah so like there's radicalism and there's all this this hype but it seems to always be pointing in the wrong direction it's always it's always targeted to bang the wrong doors down um and that's very very common of a lot of uh political movements is what you see as controlled opposition um and that's a, a form of you know a counterintelligence or psyops as, as people call it it's um it's a way to you know mislead your opposition by you know you create this bandwagon again the bus idea everyone gets on the bus and then the bus drives off a cliff and everyone's sort of uh and and it's done intentionally i believe um in this field to create a uh, burnout you know ufo burnout we call it it is people who have invested a lot of time and energy on on a certain case or a subject or a topic or a, a field and then they come to find out that wow i i wasted you know a lot a lot of time on this and and why do i even bother and this has brought me nothing um but aggravation and and uh it's sort of uh it's sort of a that's one of the key psychological mechanisms that are used in, in psyops it, um to demoralize your uh, opponent so it's it's no surprise that this is this is rampant and going on because um to think that this field isn't under a psyop um, is is uh, imaginary thinking uh, because it, anytime you, any anyone anywhere on this planet is is constantly under the effects of a psyop, whether it's from marketing, uh, government, or, or or what have you. Um, <laughs> there are all sorts of forces trying to um, persuade and manage your perception uh any way that they can so um i think that it, it's it's uh it's yeah it's it's important to be aware of these forces and, and be aware of these these mindsets and the group think the ideas of group think that uh this herd mentality that um that even if you know that you can be people are afraid to be wrong when this i mean it's dangerous to be right when the government's wrong uh, or it's dangerous to be right when everyone else is is wrong um and and if you want to look at it that way so this sort of sort of a uh 
And that's generated even more because we have AI now and AI has developed so much over the last 10 years. So you could be arguing with someone for hours and not even realize that, that it's a chat GPT algorithm that somebody made on a freaking computer. That's, you know, that's just there to waste your time. And you're sitting there sharing all your best facts and sources with a, a damn computer that will never, it's programmed not to agree with you. And so uh, I just have, you know, that to say about the whole mess. It's, it's, it's a dangerous place to tread, and uh, you know, I'm I, I'm real sorry to hear that you had people actually, you know, commit suicide over, over this this nonsense because it's just uh, the burnout can be real, real tough and real strong for some people, yeah. man. Well, yeah, and you think especially when we combine that with, of course, the stresses of the last three years in particular, and where people perhaps were doing a bit more online for their communities. And of course, that's brought a lot more people into UFOs and aliens and things that they wouldn't really necessarily thought about. So they don't have much of a defense against the kind of the memes and the hooks in these topics. And then they've gone into it perhaps you know, too wholeheartedly um, at a time when perhaps the manipulation has never been greater. And then, uh, you know, maybe they've, you know, they've suffered job loss. All the things that we know that have happened in the last three years, you know, couldn't go to work, couldn't go on holiday. And then... You get all in on a community, and then that community kind of ends up burning you. Um, I mean, that obviously can be really, really massively um, psychologically impacting on someone that's already in a vulnerable state. So I think that's perhaps why there's been a worse impact uh, on people in this last few years. And with it seeming so believable as well, of course, I say with the media kind of promoting the idea that something's happening, it's so much easier to believe that it's a right about to happen, and I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be part of it. And then, boom, nothing. And then you combine that with, you saw about the burnout fact as well. You know, of course, this is a kind of a depressive thing anyway. So you sort of waste all your time. You know, this, you know your, your friends turned out they weren't really friends. They're using you to contact the senator or whatever. Um, and I just see that as being, yeah, it's a few things comes together. And I think that's, yeah, definitely pushed some people off the edge. And at the very least, have abandoned social media, realizing, you know, that their communities weren't real as such. Um, so yeah, it's, I think that's perhaps a combination of issues have come together to worsen an already problematic situation. And that's where I kind of see that. But I definitely the burnout thing is very important at the moment with the with the way that we're seeing these kind of these government, uh, you know, Senate inquiries and what I want to call them that of course these are seen as kind of focal points where people are like, well, there's there's a hearing, you know, there's a hearing and it's going to be massive and the rumors start spilling out. You know, they're gonna they're gonna mention bodies they're going to mention alien bodies it's going to be there and you know it's all going to be worthwhile and then it doesn't happen and so then you have a wave of people in that that'll be burned out because they're like well i was waiting for a year for that and then there's, there's another hearing you know there's another one this time it's going to be crash retrievals they're going to say it. it's going to be you know right up front and you know it's not mentioned instead it's we've got no evidence of extraterrestrials no special technology you know that's not what those people have invested the last two or three four years into right that they're waiting to hear that announcement pretty much of, yes, the bodies are here. Here's the photo, you know, of this creature in a tank, you know, that we've had since 1940. That, there are people that are believing that's what's going to happen. And so you can imagine them being knocked sideways when the scientist says, well, I, I've got nothing here interesting, really. I mean, just some weird videos that I've been looking. I mean, that's not what those people are ready to hear. And that can be really destabilizing for someone that's been building up in their mind how that event's going to look you know especially over years hey everyone i'm sorry to interrupt what i imagine is a really interesting conversation i just wanted to let you know about project unity's new merchandise store it's a great way to help project unity grow and you get some stylish merchandise at the same time you can also choose to support project unity via patreon for as little as four dollars a month and this will give you access to our private discord server which has become a bustling social hub full of researchers and passionate people, a very friendly community, and we would love to see you become a part of it. You can also donate through PayPal if you like, and links to all of these can be found in the description box below. And of course, to help us in our battle against the YouTube algorithm, the best thing you can do is like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell to stay updated. And now, I'll let you get back to that fascinating talk that I was, I was thinking about this thing I read one time. It was called uh, The Rage of Achilles, and it was uh, a take on PTSD. I don't know if you ever read the Iliad in, in high school. I don't know if you had to read. Oh, why? yeah, I did, but I can't remember it. 
Anyways, yeah, it, it's a, the one of the most boring that used to put me. I, I read it now if I have to go to sleep and I can't go to sleep. <laughs> it puts me right out. Uh, but anyways, uh, it, Achilles, apparently his leader was Agamemnon, and Agamemnon betrayed him, uh, among a number of other things that it, they said there were like these three um, things that happened to him that caused him to have this PTSD because at the beginning, right, he was he was like, he couldn't fight, he couldn't do anything. He was just like super depressed. He couldn't even move like, he was just like all messed up. And they said, you know, people rereading the story said, oh, he's, he shows signs of PTSD or this post-traumatic stress disorder. And I just thought about this as like, you know, if you're betrayed, I, I guess he lost a close friend in battle, was betrayed by a, a leader, and um, all these like key things happened to him in um, that led him to become and in, in enter that state. And then finally something happens that snaps him out of the state and, and he goes in on a rage af after they dip him in that thing that with, with everything but his ankle and he goes on a rage and just goes on a massive killing spree in the book. But uh, the key part is is this Achilles syndrome is what it used to be called um, before it was called PTSD, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was just this idea of the soldiers becoming disillusioned with battle and, and, and their mission and, and their idea. And um, it's sort of the same psychological operations, you know, because we do this to our enemies. We try to, we try to like screw with their minds as much as possible so that their soldiers become disillusioned with the war, disillusioned with the battle. And they realize you know, back in the 60s or 70s, what was the Mind War document published? So um, one of John Alexander and our friend in psychological operations there, uh, one of his good friends, I think it's actually his cousin or something, uh, is a guy named Michael Aquino. I don't know if you ever heard of this fellow before. No. Michael Aquino wrote a book, um, a document called Mind War, Right. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I've heard the name. It sounds like that mind war sounds familiar. Yeah. From psyop to mind war, uh, the psychology of victory, hmm. with the guy named Paul E. Valley, a colonel a commander, and um, so Michael Keeney was a psyop research and, and, and analysis team leader. Um, he's also the uh, head priest of a, a satanic temple called the Temple of Set in Los Angeles. Hmm. He helped or was for for years I mean, he might be retired now he's he's quite old he might have actually passed away i'm not not sure um what michael aquino is doing these days but yeah he was a good friend of john alexander's and uh into all this mike you know psychological network yeah. and in that mind war document he talks about you know um how the vietnam war was the first war that was televised and by Jane Fonda and, and other reporters bringing the footage of the Vietnam War back to American audiences on television for the first time, mm -hmm. Americans became dis disillusioned with you know the government's and White House and military's war propaganda, um, that the war propaganda was no longer effective because people were seeing you know video imagery uh, firsthand of what was actually taking place on the ground over there. So. Um, then they noticed that, you know, it, that was the whole birth of that whole civil rights movement, this big political moment, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, the government realized we got to put a stop to this. And they, they quickly, um, you know, moved in tons and tons of drugs and got everyone hooked on drugs and, and uh, sent down that rabbit hole for a long time, fighting the war on drugs, uh, you know, which, which has been an utter failure uh, and led to more cartels and, and uh, you know, billionaires, the whole Guzman thing with El Chapo. And uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't have existed if it weren't for all that stuff. Uh, people like that wouldn't exist. They wouldn't be in bed with the Mexican government like they are completely and with the banks, you know, which pay a slap on the wrist, uh, a couple million dollar fee for the billions that they launder and drug money for the cartels every, every year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's really interesting, you know, going and, and, and learning about all that stuff uh, because I, I see a lot of that mind war, that psychology of victory. They realized, you know, they had to put a stop to this, uh, this 
information flow and then the free thinking and and then also that that idea of you know you need to create fake leaders then let the leaders betray you or let you down over and over again and you need to see like other people who are close to you like just you know give up or or or, or fail or flail out or, or something and all those factors would be significant uh, psychological operators to get mm-hmm. people abandoned post or you know just become disillusioned with the battle that they're trying to fight whether it's for disclosure mm-hmm. yeah whatever yeah these are the uh these are the age-old tactics that we mm-hmm. see being utilized um you know th- this uh th- this subject is, is so vast and uh, and there are many angles through which we can begin to chip away at the issue and discover new information and, and bring things to the forefront. So it's certainly not a uh, not a linear path of, of inquisition when attempting to unravel uh, the UFO mystery and the government involvement and uh, uh, especially, the, I guess, the overall implications of what it, of what is truly going on here. Um, that being said, I'd be I'd be interested to, to know from both of you, uh, what you personally feel are the most important aspects of this subject to focus on. So uh, how about Bruce, let's start with you. Um, what What is most important to you personally? Yeah. So, I mean, we're looking at the, we call it the unidentified anomalous phenomena topic. And I, I kind of, like that, because I know UFOs, I, I have a problem with the term. Again, the terminology has been used in a kind of militarized fashion against us. Because, I mean, even the very term UFOs, you know, is um, problematic because, of course, on on the one hand, people hear UFOs and they think alien spaceships. You know, on the other hand, other people hear UFOs and they think idiots seeing clouds and Venus and, you know, and it doesn't really mean anything. I'm actually, before you could carry on, I'm reminded of Neil deGrasse Tyson going, it's unidentified, so we don't know what it is, so we can't say it's alien because it's unidentified. So exactly playing into that problem with the categorization, absolutely. Categorization and terminology, you know, word wars are, are a big part of what we are in as well. Terminology um, is really important because, because the meaning of words, and we've seen this in the last year, again, the, the changing meaning of words and also weaponization of terms and stuff, right? And, and words you can't say anymore, words you should say. And, you know, we kind of live in this kind of spelling, word magic, or we say these are kind of a word war. And so for me, in a way, I, I kind of prefer this use of now they're saying, unidentified anomalous phenomena. You know, for a while it was unidentified aerial phenomena, now it's anomalous phenomena. Because personally, I'm only really interested in anomalies, right? An anomalous phenomena. Because anything else is mundane. I don't really care if it's a cloud, Venus, a plane. I don't care, right? I'm not interested in any of that stuff. If, if something is not exhibiting anomalies, well, I leave that to someone else. You know what I mean? So my focus is anomaly. So what I find important is the edges of the known. So if I say the most important thing in in my focus is always that, what's at the edges of the known? What's happening here that is questioning the fabric of known reality or of known culture, known society, known science? You know, because that's what's going to transform the world, which I'm not content with. I don't like how the world functions. I don't like the power structures in the world. Not keen on you know either the political part, all of that. So anything where I can see there's a crack that might help change that, that's where my focus is, right? And so I know that brings me to conflict because a lot of people want very mundane things to be interesting. You know, uploading videos of like, slow moving dots doing nothing spectacular, right? That for me is not worth wasting three seconds on. Um, just as someone telling you a tale of you know. The bright light they saw down the path. I'm so you know I'm sure it was important for them, but for me that that is that's nothing, right? I'm interested in teleporting or you know uh, beings that can appear and disappear or you know when it becomes extraordinary and anomalous, that's where I see potential for us to change something. And my my particular interest is really social engineering, if I'm honest, because social engineering is usually the the hobby of the rich and powerful. Right, because they have the money and influence to shape the world to how they want it, and, and we've seen the direction that, that most of those people would like to take us because we're living in that direction, right? So they've successfully taken us down a path into a kind of global society that I don't like, right? So my focus has to be on 
any cracks where I can try to reverse some of that, but without the money and power. So that puts me into a position where I can only use my intellect and look at these little cracks, these anomalies, and see if I can enlarge one to the point where it starts causing a problem for that fabric that we're living in. And so, I mean, that's I just kind of an abstract way to say why I'm interesting, but that's really the interest is social engineering based on anomalies, based on things that cause a problem for the system and for those who are shepherding us down into this world that I don't like the looks of. And so it's, I don't know if that really answered it. So that could be aliens, that could be, you know, underground civilizations, it, it could be psychic powers, um, you know, all of these things that are on the edges of the known, really. So I, that's why I kind of, quite a, a wide breadth of interests. It's not just UFOs or just aliens or just human origins. It's wherever I see, hang on, there's a crack in this story. I found evidence that compels me to believe that I can argue that this is bogus and that there's enough data there to sit and debate with someone who is in that field. So, you know, like I have to debate an anthropologist if I'm talking about human origins. I'd have to debate a physicist if it's about, you know, magical looking powers of some craft. You know, that you have to be able to find somewhere where you, you have enough data, enough evidence to be able to confidently go on a show like this and go into kind of combat with someone who's on the other side of that topic, but with the knowledge to say, well, no, the system's right. If we say, no, the system's wrong. That's why I like to bring myself up to the point where I can challenge those kind of system agents and begin to push back on the direction we're being dragged in. So uh, hopefully that makes some sense in a kind of abstract way yeah absolutely does man absolutely does and jeremy what about yourself what's most important for you personally in terms of the uh, the kind of the keystone issues for the ufo topic you're on uh jeremy you're on you're on mute brother i'd say it would be the uh what I'm, my has been my goal for about 10 years now uh forced disclosure through technology and it's about interviewing the scientists creating a community online for the, the scientists to um, discuss and share things for skeptic community to engage in this we can sort of weed out the fakers and the and the frauds the people that are um you know claiming that they have the background and 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 are claiming that they have the knowledge they can present as well and and be met with uh you know skeptics questions and a q a we do give like an hour presentation and an hour q a uh, for most of these people so i think this is been it's been working pretty well since uh you know the apec conference started around when covid uh you know hit and we're going to probably be bringing that back not quite so frequently can you, can you explain what the apec conference is for people oh if you go to altpropulsion.com you can check out uh the apec conference which is alternative propulsion engineering conference and it's it's a conference where we get people who worked on, we had, you know, for example, Ronald Evans, who worked on Project Green Glow for BAE over in the UK on about a month before he was on BBC. And we had um, a number of, you know, other scientists on. We've I, I had an old interview with Eugene Podglitnov. We didn't, haven't been able to get him on. We got, you know, Tony Robertson from NASA who worked on the NASA replications of the Podglitnov experiment, and he knew Ning Lee. And uh, we've gotten, you know, a number of these people on to get, you know, inside information and inside scoop on, on the science behind a lot of this stuff and these programs and, and the stories. So um, it gives people uh, an, a more open window into, the, you know, these these types of worlds and how, you know, how DARPA goes about finding and recruiting, you know, contracts for, for research and where we're at technologically, according to you know, where we're at with the contracts, because, you know, if we really did figure this all out in the fifties as, you know, Michael Schratt and, uh, Stephen Greer th seem to think, then, um, why are we still, you know, funding research into figuring it out, you know, in modern times and, uh, why haven't any of our, you know, laboratory people been able to replicate it with, you know, modern day equipment, which is arguably way better than, you know, what scientists were working with back in the fifties. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, discrepancy here, and we're just trying to answer those questions with science and, and replication. And I think that's the best path forward in all of this. It's the only way I can really separate those knowns and unknowns. And again, yeah, yeah, we're super interested in those anomalies and and that that what we call the fringe, that 
limit of where the known meets the unknown. And uh, that's sort of what, that is exactly what I do, fringe science. I, we're, on, we're on that fringe, and uh, I like to um, stay there and, and, and hope that we can, you know, be, be a benefit to somebody in, in the, you know, in the mix and, and provide a platform for these people if they, if they do need one to, uh, to use for disclosure. What do you uh, what do you make of like um, all of the apparent former uh, sorry the apparent quotes from the former director of Lockheed Skunk Works Ben Rich like uh, I don't know how many of them have been fully verified but he he apparently has come out with some very interesting quotes like the one at UCLA back in I think the eighties when he was saying about we have the the means to travel among the stars and all of this do you do you think that this is accurate when it comes to Ben Rich there was also the um, uh, the now disgraced MUFON director, I think he was director, but uh, he he claimed to have had a conversation at a, co a conference with Ben Rich where he said, uh, you know, how are these things working? And uh, apparently Ben Rich said, said to him, how does telekinesis work? And he said, um, all points in space and time are connected. And he went, that's how it works. And he walks off. Um, so as a, as, a, as a physics guy and as a kind of black tech researcher, what, what do you make of Ben Rich? Do you think it's legit? Um... So the, the, I'm trying to figure out the, um, was it Jan Aldrich was the guy, the, the MUFON director? I think so. I think so. I know he's now uh, obviously in a, in a hell of a lot of trouble and is not exactly someone to quote uh, for uh, credibility's sake, but he claimed to have had this, uh, you know, exposure to Ben Rich and it's not the only data point. Ben Rich has apparently made a whole bunch of statements over the years, you know? And then I, I believe the other uh, quote is a secondhand quote that it was, came from, uh, was it Jim Goodall? Or yes. Was it? Yeah, it was Goodall, wasn't it? Yeah, I think. Where he said, we've got, we've got things flying around in the desert that are 50, 100 years beyond what you could even comprehend and things like this. You know? we can now take E.T. home. We can now take E.T. home. If you've seen it on Star Wars or seen it on Star Trek, we've been there, done that, or, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. You know, there's all of these quotes attributed to Ben Rich, and I think most of them, if not all of them, are basically just secondhand source claims uh, without, uh, I, I would imagine, full verification. So I, I'd like to know what your intuition tells you about his level of knowledge since he was skunk works it's interesting because you know you got to consider the source for a lot of these things uh but because i i've been i tried to track down and verify that because you yeah. know conversations and and then you you know a lot of the skeptics will will say you know well actually you know there's no proof that he ever he ever actually said that and and you know what <laughs> i looked into it and they're right yep uh, so it's it's hard to nail that one down for sure um whether or not he what they knew i mean you gotta think right so he the 10 days before he died goodall says he spoke to him and this is what he told him um again this could be an embellished story for a lot of reasons say you know this uh but i'm not gonna you know jim goodall's a good guy and i'm not gonna accuse him of you know uh, making it up but he may might have might have uh he might have told jim some things too you know jim jim was the kind of guy too you know so it makes sense that you know if you're gonna tell somebody jim would be the kind of guy you'd say it to you know uh so i don't know um it's it's hard to say because all we do know for sure is that you know the late 1990s when you know he died i i think he when, when which year did he die actually let me look this up yeah i can't remember that can't remember when he died uh, I just want to get the it in the nineties or. I was going to say one of the issues I have with um, with some of the leaks I mm -hmm. think fly around is that you know there's a benefit to these companies to both deny that they have certain technologies, but the hint that they do. So the, the yeah. allowing of certain rumors to flow. Because of course, if it seems like your corporation might have amazing technologies or even alien technologies, that's a good thing. But at the same time, you don't confirm you've really got certain technologies, but that's a bad thing. So they, they're, they're in a gray area. Where it's kind of like an uh, air, air of mystique. Right, because that, that hints that you've got something amazing in your corporation. And so mm -hmm. that people get interested, you know, so. Right. It's also, yeah, it's good publicity, it's good PR, and it's good for investors and, and your stock. Your stock goes up and, and, and that. So I guess I understand that. But you know what? The fact that he died in January 1995, so that's right the start of 1995 interesting my my birthday is the 20th of january 1995 so that's an interesting yeah. point. so january 5th of 1995 is when ben rich wow. died um it's before i was born 15 days before i was born 
15 days before you were born, Jay. So, um, this is, turn, is it? this is interesting because this is, this is just a couple months after Al Cubier published the warp drive paper in 1994, right. Right. which that set off a whole wave of the, the Lockheed Martin and other companies going to look into that. So 1995, they would have just been, you know, starting, this was before you know, Hayes really ninety seven, ninety eight is when he started publishing papers on, you know, zero point energy and inertia and the inertia getting the inertial field from zero the zero point energy and where does inertia derive from in physics and, and, and all this you know, the, the 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 deep physics research that as senior staff physicist at Lockheed Martin, Bernard Hayes was performing for Lockheed Martin during those years. That didn't come Till after Ben Rich died, so I, I that that makes me even more skeptical of him. Mm. Um, yeah, so I don't know what they could have had back in '95 if 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 they had, you know, that that was that was basically when all this stuff was before it even started. Really, you know, it was just Interesting. starting. Interesting. It would have made more sense. That's why I was like, was it 2000s, '98? You know, '98. Still kind of like cutting it, you know, but two thousands, you know, maybe he knew something, but yeah, this is like kind of before the time that Lockheed. I don't, I don't have any evidence going back to the mid nineties or before that they were working on, you know, anything related to what uh, I believe they need to b build a warp drive. Right, E home. That's that what you need to take E T home is a warp drive. So I haven't seen any evidence that that you know ninety four is. That's when the warp drive basically started. So, yeah, one of the problems we have, isn't it? I mean, like I'd say, Jeremy, is that I mean, to utilize any of these really radical technologies, you need the energy systems to even begin experimenting with them. Because you know, we start talking about real high energy physics. That you know, what would you have powered these kinds of devices within the in the forties or fifties? It's 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 really hard to believe someone would have had a suitable energy source to even do the kind of the initial experiments. You know, let alone start running, you know, warp drives or energy weapons. As I just, I think, you know, a lot of this stuff is energy problems, and that you need to have the next kind of energy supply in place, like whether you know nuclear power stations or whatever it is that's going to power this. You know, you have a problem at the time that there just doesn't seem to be an energy source to really do this stuff back then. So I, I find it really hard to believe they could have got far. You know what I mean? It's how how do you guys feel about? Um... You know the, the the kind of Nazi Germany thread within the UFO lore of you know these guys were creating novel stuff and then obviously paperclip they came over and this got integrated into the black programs and you know there's it's something that people swear blind to and there are some good researchers who have kind of you know brought some information out that suggests they were doing some pretty uh, weird experimentation. I mean, you know, set, set aside all of the Joseph Mengele nightmarish experiments they were doing in eugenics and things like that. But in terms of like exotic and novel propulsion, um, uh, Jeremy, do you have any, any thoughts on the kind of Nazi German black tech um, thread? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I had, I was on with Joseph Farrell recently. On, mm, uh, yeah, he's one I was thinking of. Uh, Walter Bosley's channel, uh, I, he, he had Joseph Farrell on. I got to come on and ask him a bunch of questions. So I finally got to drill him on a little bit more of the physics and some of the uh, the scientists involved. And, uh, you know, I looked into into some of the stuff, you know, that he, he was getting into. And, it, and you know, I, it'd just be, it'd be, it'd be more interesting if we had some more hardcore data on that because I know... I, I know that some of these, you know, theories were right on point with some of the, you know, the Gra gravito magnetic field and these ideas of the of uh, gravity and this kinematic field and, and and ideas of inertia and then Car Einstein Carton theory and and some of the stuff. But I, I wish there was like a paper or something more specific that we could point to and say, aha, you know, here it is in the literature from that time period, because um, it's just. I'm, I'm missing, I'm, I'm sort of missing that in, in, in there's a lot of, uh, you know, guessing and hand waving that, that, that the scientists could have been involved in this, but you know, there's no, like, I'm still looking for a, a, a paper or something, you know, some kind of experimental proof that they were doing these experiments with that. You know, it's, it's interesting. You have this 
you know, General Electric was apparently doing some experiments in the early uh, 70s, late 60s uh, with a guy named Henry William Wallace, um, believe it or not. Uh, and he was from Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And they were doing the research at GE because they already had a plant that was, you know, set up to manufacture mercury vapor discharge lamps so that they were already making, you know, working with mercury and, and discharges and, and uh, all that, this all the technologies and materials and, and safety precautions and everything that they they needed to uh, do those experiments with uh, rotating mercury and mercury plasmas and stuff. So that that's that came about in, in the 60s here in America. Um, I, I just have confusion on how it why it would take so long for the Americans to start those experiments when the, the Nazis were allegedly doing this in the 1940s with Project Reese and, and the Bell, you know? So I, I, it's just curious how, how it took the, the U.S. 25, 26 years at least to, uh, to, to catch up or, or, or to start trying those kind of experiments themselves. And I can't really find any more information about you know, those type of experiments being done anywhere else in the, in the physics literature ex until, you know, they started with the high temperature superconductors and this rotating superconductor thing that they were doing at NASA, which is s arguably similar to, you know, mercury was the first superconductor ever discovered. So um, it's arguably similar to the rotating mercury um, experiments of the, that GE was doing. So I... Again, I, it, that that whole thing ties into the bell, which was allegedly this purple fluid that rotated and glowed under test. And uh, but where's the where's the physics? You know, where's the hardcore physics literature or background or paper or document for all that? And you know, I, I've looked into some of these guys. I haven't really you know spent the whole time. Uh, one was a guy, Kozyrev, Kozyrev, uh, K O Z Y R E V. And, um, but then again, this is the only re re reference I can find on this is, uh, is on David Wilcox's site. So it's like, consider the source, man. No, I, I want, I want, I want to believe this, but I've just not seen, I'm not it's seeing not enough of a paper trail. It's not enough of a paper trail yet, man. Yeah. And, I, I mean, I suppose, you know, given the fact that paperclip was a kind of uh, interagency uh, um, uh, um, procedure there's there's the chance that this stuff is obscured in some dusty folder in the CIA or you know they've got they've got these patents that you know the Germans were working on but again this is all conjecture it's hard to know and there's you know some threads of interesting claims and stories but that's about as far as it goes, which to be fair is, is kind of the, 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 the trademark of ufology in general. Some very interesting stories and some threads and some, uh, you know, kind of uh, data points, but overall a lot of ambiguity uh, and not enough clarity. Uh, Bruce, you got anything to add there? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, it kind of takes back to the recent uh, conversation that um, Eric Weinstein had when he was talking about that. You know, we, we have all these claims of extraordinary physics and yet, they're nearly all from people with no knowledge of physics. No physics not, they're, knowledge, right, yeah. they're not scientists. So we have, and that, that goes back all the way to the sort of the 40s. We have all these extraordinary stories of technologies and, you know, breakthroughs and you know, weapon systems. But it's nearly always coming from either witnesses or soldiers or, you know, inside intelligence people that know something about a project, right? So none of these people are able to provide the the actual scientific framework for how any of these supposed things work. So, and I think he really, he was sort of popped a bubble there, you know, and it should make everyone think, because he's like, well, where are these scientists that are supposed to tell us, why are we listening to military people telling us that extraordinary physics is happening and that, you know, things are breaking the laws of physics? Who are these people to say that, right? Because they, if they were to sit down with, um, with, a, with any actual scientist, they would probably be baffled the minute the terminology was even started to be used. And yet they're the ones telling us that the laws of physics are broken. I bet they couldn't even tell you the laws of physics, you know? And so there's this, there's this really strange disconnect where we've become used in these communities to being told these extraordinary things by people who are woefully unqualified to, to lecture us on them, right? And that is a major problem. Obviously, like, 
you know, I, if some of these witnesses sat down with someone like Jeremy and had a conversation, a lot of the time, I'm sure he'd feel that he was talking to someone who didn't know what they were talking about, right? And, and that's the problem is there's not enough actual scientists coming out with information that you can go and reference and like say, look for the paper trail, see where was the development of such a technology? Even if it broke away from public facing science, right? It went dark. You'd have to see some origin for that technology, right? It, it, otherwise, you have to go back to that, yeah, aliens gave them the technology or something. Because otherwise, where is the initial, you know, roots to that tree that branched off and gave us, you know, all these weapon systems and stuff? It has to be somewhere in the side. Scientific- countless examples of like technologies that we know of where it, it came out, it was talked about, you know, and then disappeared or went dark and is currently dark or involved in projects. You know, like I, I can give I can give countless examples. I can give well not countless, but I can get I can give probably a dozen. Well, that was that's that's the thing. I mean, I you know, in the in the nineteen fifties, around that period, there was a genuine interest in things like electrogravitics and gravity generation and, and, and that did seem to go weirdly dark and there was a bit of an iron curtain of secrecy that fell down. So I guess there is uh, you know, to a certain extent, some form of a potential origin point for novel and very exotic disruptive technologies being put into the black world and, and essentially ushered away. But it's, uh, yeah, there, there, there isn't enough that's conclusive. Jeremy, if, if you've got anything to, to kind of highlight here, um, go ahead. Yeah, that's exactly what we tried to do with APEC and, and the all propulsion you know, conference is, is basically give this platform create this platform where we can bring in experts, you know, people who worked for NASA, people who worked for DARPA, people who went to MIT and have degrees in, in, in these subjects so that you can, you know, if people are legit and they want to bring disclosure, they have a platform to do that. And if they're not legit, then we have a platform to expose that. And either way, it's a, it's been a win-win situation so far. Um, we've, you know, educated a lot of people on these subjects who who didn't know a lot about this before, and we're curious, you know, on just how far we've gotten and what the government's worked on. And um, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it goes beyond that. I'm sure there's programs that we don't know about, and and that it, the research has gone deeper than this. I, I I would almost guarantee that it has. Um, if if it hasn't, then they're not doing their job clearly. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, that's that's basically where I'm at and I, I totally I, I agree with that we, we we came up with this idea for for uh, this is how we handle this is, is we have to create a, a panel of experts so that we can sort of vet this information or sort this stuff out for people who you know can listen to a guy who's a complete bullshitter and not and not know the difference you know I I have a I have a small filter but I'm only a bachelor in, in, of science so I, I rely on these you know subject matter experts in those fields to, to, uh, as, as key witnesses or, uh, you know, credibility judges. <laughs> what you say, I mean, that's a problem as well. We have in the field in is that, you know, a lot of us are doing heavier lifting than we'd want to be doing, but because the experts that we would love to see in these topics are still kind of intimidated or don't see them as worthwhile. So, you know, it, it's unfortunate and that's part of what's allowed a lot of, you know, grifters and, you know, liars to get away with it because there, there aren't enough people that can kind of gently grill them in front of others and show that they have no understanding of the topics they're in, right? Because if there was loads of subject experts in in ufology and in study of aliens, and you know, if there was loads of actual people that were highly knowledgeable, you know, and understood the science behind things that were being claimed, there would be very few grifters and, you know, cult leader types surviving the grillings on every show and every conference they went to you know they they couldn't get away with it but there there aren't enough knowledgeable skeptical minds you know open skeptical minds in these communities you know it's kind of the the the, the more hardened skeptics that really are not that open to it and then there's a few of us like in the middle who are interested in scientific analysis also you know opens maybe some of the stuff that's just over the edges of that but you know, but I'm willing to swallow everything, you know, that you know, we're willing to critique it. And it's just, I think there just isn't enough. That's a big problem we have in ufology yes. and in the ancient aliens and stuff. It's just that lack of um, other people to do more of that lifting to say that, you know, teams like Jeremy's talking about, you need kind of teams who would be able to invite someone to a conference, but knowing that in the back of your mind, you invite them to see if they're full of shit because that's your feeling. 
but you'd want to see them kind of present and have people you know ask them questions you know say okay so exactly how does that you know that capacitor connect to work you know it's something where they can be pulled up on and someone else can turn and say well that wouldn't work you know i know that wouldn't work um and that's that's what we need to i think create is a more of these networks of experts and as scientists are starting to take more interest in the topic hopefully there can be a bit more of a collaboration between i'd say those of us that kind of at least have a kind of urban skepticism and knowledge enough to get a sense to when we think something is probably uh, disinfo or bogus or is just grifting and be able to then you know get others involved with checking that out to see what they think of it you know that's i'd hope yeah. to see going forward there's more of that because that's one of the big issues that we're facing in this there's just you can get you can go to a conference now and you could you can pretty much make up anything say whatever you want and get paid and get away with it and have yeah. very few people there even know what questions to ask them to show that it was crap yeah no, no this this is this is very true i mean you know as with all things when money begins to flow um greed can override morals can override truth uh can override uh, objectivity and uh, and it can become a real problem when attempting to address uh, this issue due to financial incentives being present, which may cause a conflict of interest. You know, now I'm not throwing shade or making money in this subject. That would be hypocritical because I do make money through this subject. Um, but I've I, I I feel I've maintained a, a pretty objective viewpoint, and I uh, I don't feel particularly torn between what I want to say and how that could affect me financially because I've I've built a platform that is pretty much all about kind of challenging official dirt and, and asking those kind of questions. Um, but I sense in some people that there could be a conflict of interest that making money from this subject may override uh, their desire to to seek actual truth. So, do you guys feel this is uh, that this is accurate? The greed that uh, money making has in some cases overtaken the desire for actual truth to be told, and that uh, you know hyping up claims or drumming up excitement to gain clicks has become a more prominent issue to be addressed as we go forward. I mean, I'll just quickly say I think if you're going to seek support you know and that can be people's time putting into helping you it could be them you know boosting you or it could be them putting money into you that you should be going to the mindset of providing value to the exactly community. yeah and therefore to have a reciprocal element to that is completely ethical right mm -hmm. if you're going in there with the mindset how do i leverage yeah my mind of my fantasy to get them yeah that then that is not ethical it might not be criminal but it's not ethical so I think as long as people are going with the mindset, I want to add value to this community, reciprocal um, relationships are totally normal in every topic. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, no, because it's kind of, it, it, a lot of people kind of uh, consider it like a, an anathema to make any sort of money in this subject. They yeah. think that, that that will completely, you've got no credibility anymore. And I think and that's a little bit... Problem because some it, of these people are religious about the topic. Yes. So this is when you start being seen as being a, a, a some kind of... Um, What's the word? You know, you're, you're kind of breaking the rules of the religion because like in religion, you know, you're not supposed to monetize. It's like, it's the great thing. You know, the great thing is coming, but it's coming from the divine. And how could you charge for divine knowledge? And that kind of, there's a sense of that often. Yes. They say, you know, why should you even be able to profit from a book that's about wisdom and about UFO knowledge? I mean, that should be free. And it's, it's, it, I hear a lot from people and you think this isn't religion. You know, this is people yeah. who do scholarly work. They've written their book like they would in any other topic that they're not seeing it like that. But unfortunately, a large part of the community is in a kind of a ufology religion, whether they realize it or not. And they're behaving like religious adepts, not like people interested in a study of, you know, a scientific field. So I, I know what Jeremy thinks, but that, that's something I know. Not everyone, but there is a proportion of people who see it as you are blaspheming yes. when you ask for money for your time in these topics. That's a good point. Jeremy, how do you feel? Yeah, it, that's a good point. I mean, it, you can't you can't really survive in this world without money. Uh, and I put a lot of my own time and and my money into into this field and this topic. And you know, I I've made some money. I can't say I've made no money off of you know this. So people have sent me money or people have super, super chats and and other right. stuff. People have funded the research. Um, so I've gotten paid to do research and stuff like that, which is, you know, again, a reciprocal relationship where I'm providing something of value to the community in exchange for, uh, you know, financial support. Uh, so I, I definitely say that it's unreasonable to assume that, you know, like 
at just because someone's making money that they're a grifter or, or, or of some kind. Um, but there are, there is a problem with, uh, you know, people in this community, you know, making money, making money and not really providing good information or good, uh, credible sources and, and, and credible information. So I do see that as a problem as well. Yeah. I, I pointed out how easy it would be for, you know, intelligence agencies rather than to hire um, an agent and send him through intelligence school and then put him into this field, it's much easier to find organic disinformation, misinformed people in this field to prop up and, and fund uh, to create disinformation agents. That way it, it's much more uh, economical and also just natural. That's just, there's, there's plenty of them out there who, uh, who will relish it in someone sending them money and supporting the, their platform uh, to spread whatever it, message that that they have to spread. Uh, so yeah, I I see I see a lot of that. Um, uh, but again, um, as far as me personally, it's uh, I'm I'm looking to eventually you know monetize in my channel and do the memberships and all that. I haven't done it yet. I'm still working on that, and I want to you know, create more products to sell. That's not just t-shirts and coffee mugs and, and, and <laughs> um, although t-shirts would be pretty cool and I have some cool ideas for those. Um, but yeah, it's, so there, 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 there are appropriate ways yeah, to mo to monetize yeah. as long as you're, you know, and you're not just, you know, taking people's money for the pro, you know, I'm not promising that I'm going to build you a spaceship a a a and taking your money and, who, who who did who did that? No, no one did that, did they? Surely not. <laughs> Surely nobody promised an electrogravitic craft to their shareholders and never fall, followed through with it. And uh, somehow people don't have a problem with it. You know, that's a, it's never happened. <laughs> no, I mean, like, hey, look, you're right, you're right. And I think that you know, there's a, there is a fine line, obviously, when it comes to 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 making money and and remaining objective and and doing that. I've always kind of been of the opinion that I will just never put things behind a paywall. Like, I don't believe in restricting information. Like, oh, no, if you want to see this interview, you have to now pay me money. Like, you know, YouTube YouTube ad revenue or Patreons or uh, merchandise. These are all non-disruptive ways of, of kind of, you know, having some form of a, a financial livelihood whilst in this subject. Um, I just don't believe in disrupting information flow. And I, I, I've always made that promise to myself of like, you know, no matter how uh, good this gets for you, never, never stymie the information for financial gain. And and I, I truly, that's kind of like one of my tenants, like I'm not going to do that. And, you know, there are people that do that and, you know, whatever, but I just, it's not really my jam. Don't agree with it. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's about balancing it. And like you said, Bruce, there are people who are just very, uh, kind of radical or, or kind of zealots who are, who are just like, it's, it's, it's blasphemous to uh, even consider trying to make a dime off of this, you know? So it's, uh, you're always going to frustrate a few people, uh, when they see that. And then of course you just got haters, you know, haters who just don't like seeing you become, uh, more successful or doing a better job. And so there's always going to be people that shoot you down. But, uh, you know, we live in a monetary world. I, I kind of wish we didn't. I wish we lived in a, in a free energy society and we were in Star Trek universe and I was off exploring the known, the, the knowns and the unknowns, but we don't. We live in a world where, you know, money rules and you have to make money. And I personally am super grateful for the fact that I'm now in a position to make some money from this. It's my passion. So it's great that you can, you know, earn a little buck on the on the side by by doing what you enjoy the most. I mean, most people would agree that that's what you want in life, right? You want to be able to sustain yourself off of doing what you love, what you're passionate about. So as long as that doesn't conflict with morals and as long as it doesn't conflict with actually, you know, the, 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 um, the effort to bring out real information, then it's okay. But in the UFO subject, and I think especially within some of the conference circuits, you know, I've, I've, I've seen it myself. I've been to a few of these conferences um, I will say shout out to James Ian Dolly and J. Christopher King for the Inquirer Anomalous Conferences. I think they're really good. And I think that that's kind of a good direction to go a lot more uh, objective and, and intellectual discourse. But I have been to a few, a few other conferences where, you know, it's like someone on stage going, my insider source told me that the Grey's agenda is this. And it's like, dude, like, you know, there is nothing you're providing that's actually solid. But people are paying a lot of money to hear you say the same thing every single year. 
And I mean, come on. I mean, I've had loads of people email me claiming backgrounds and, you know, I could, I could leverage that. I could leverage a lot of that and say, oh, you know, I've got this guy who's in NSA or this guy that's in this and they tell me this and they tell me that. But it just doesn't sit right with me because it's a lie. <laughs> like, you know, you don't know that what they're telling you is true. And so if you don't know it's true, you shouldn't go out there and profess it to be the truth to make a quick buck. And I think that is the big issue with the UFO circuit in terms of money making. It's it's fine to make money if you're if you're genuinely, you know, passionate, objective, data driven, information driven and 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 really trying to bring something out for the community. But yes, there is a a, a significant percentage of the kind of like conference circuits where it is just all about making that money. And uh, and I do not agree with that, and I think we all agree on that. Well, yeah, and I'm sure that because of you know we're all kind of public facing, which to be honest, actually people should keep in mind as well that a lot of researchers, people in these fields, just share their updates now and again, and are not even available to be criticised and attacked in the way that I think the three of us do make ourselves available yeah. for people to say, you know, you're an asshole. So, whereas a lot of people just shut off all of that. And they just occasionally put some content out and they don't engage because they don't want the problems. And I can totally understand it. We try and be there as part of the community, which, you know, I hope people appreciate. Um, but the other thing I say is that, you know, because we're public facing, obviously we hear these stories and people, and I'm sure we all get messages that, you know, but Bruce, you know, the Martians came a million years ago and they did this. And they saw us, the, the Atlantean people under the sea. That's what it's all about. And, like, you know, we have all these stories. Like, if I wanted to put a conference together of just wild stories, yeah. and I'm sure any of us could do that we'd be like go through our messages oh uh, there was that guy who said wasn't it, that he's you know he's a bird man from venus and like i could just go through getting all these people putting them on stage all claiming i know the answers it's the bird men and then the other guy in it no no the alliances i mean those people there's, there's plenty of them you know very passionate people very certain of themselves all with conflicting stories um and unfortunately there's a willingness for people to platform them I, I would not be willing to do that because I know that if you have, the, the thing they have in common is they don't have one jot of evidence that they will share with you, but they just know it. They yeah. know it. And I don't have any time for that at all. I can just be honest. I mean, I'd rather get in contact and say, it here, please don't tell me how certain you are that it's the underground people or it's this. Because if you're not willing to critique that and say, I have no evidence of this, it's something I sort of dreamt up or I read in a book or something and I just believe it. Otherwise, like, it's just a fantasy story to me, right? And I, I, I would not platform those people at a conference. Other people do. And I find that unethical. Yeah. Jeremy, anything to add? No, I'm in, I'm in perfect agreement with that. Yeah. yeah. Only well, do it. Is, there, is there anything that you guys want to bring up before we wrap this up? We've been going for almost two hours, covered a few really important topics. Um, if there is anything else that you want to highlight before we begin kind of uh, closing this up, then go ahead. If not, then we can uh, we can finish it. Well, I think it'd be nice to see a few of the tips where we'd like to see things going and what could be done better. I mean, yeah. you know, from, from my view, I would like to see people take the time to zoom in on some of the more, you know, the anomalous phenomena that's out there and to try and just to, you know, to try and critique a bit more and say, you know, particularly like say videos and stories, but to say, you know, what in this is genuinely anomalous? You know, what is it here that I could zoom into and perhaps find, you know, that little nugget of information or evidence that could potentially move things forward a little bit? Because it's not going to be of that that light in the sky going at perfectly normal speed, you know, and stuff like that is, we know that's not going to have any impact, right? So I'd love to see people starting to refine down to find those nuggets, you know, instead of just a mass of stuff that does nothing and is not helping anyone. It's just a, a sea of sort of garbage, you know, I don't be horrible, but kind of a sea of garbage and of stories that you can't follow up, stories that are not going to lead anywhere, right? And to, to start to narrow this down to, does that story have evidence, you know, that we could explore? You know, does that video have something that indicates that in that area there's, you know, there's something else happening that we could go and investigate? You know, I, th I think it really needs people to start becoming investigators and researchers in that way and not just saying, well, there's all this stuff. That, there's enough evidence because there's 8 million stories of it and that proves it. It's like, uh, I know Jeremy said before, we've got to start, like, looking at the individual cases, like a case-by-case -case assessment. I know you said that as well, that we need to... It has to be more like that, not just this, all these stories and therefore there's aliens and time travelers. And it's like, we need to narrow that down and people to be a bit more, a lot more discerning 
and also to develop the skill sets of researchers and investigators. Read some science papers. You know, it won't kill you. You could all do it. I mean, honestly, you don't need to be a PhD to go on to, you know, journals and skim through. I mean, just read the conclusions. If you don't want to read a whole thing, usually you can get the sense of it by reading the introduction and the conclusion as to whether it's worth reading the rest. You know, that would be a simple tip for anyone. If you want to understand a topic more, what is the conclusion? Is it worth reading? Is it really compelling? Go back and read it if it is. There are papers on, you know, the strange physics of craft. There are papers on anomalies in history, anomalies in our biology. You know, read that stuff. I mean, you're all capable of doing it. Don't be scared. I say, don't be scared of looking at science papers and going away from the blogs a bit and away from, you know, all the stories and actually think if maybe you could find something anomalous in that data because often the scientists are hyper-focused on one thing in their study and they don't notice the anomaly that you would notice, right? So I'd say to anyone, you could all find things in studies that someone's missed. Well, and another thing I wanted to point out in addition to that, Bruce, is that in most of the cases that they found that they could not identify or were in the unsolved or anomalous box in the era of study were actually cases where they, they just determined they don't have enough data to make a determination. So one of the problems is is that the data we, we have, are we just, and, and a reminder that we're not just talking about you know grainy videos or, or, or even any you know videos, even high def you know 60 frame a second videos. Um, what we need is is to talk about the sensor data, the, the other types of sensors that are evolved. So UFOs, if they're um, apparently a couple of them give off other types of frequencies, other types of signals. So there's other types of, you know, signals, intelligence, and data collection on other frequencies that um, are used by the military. They're not, you know, discussed super openly with the public. Um, I think that's more of the classified hearing stuff, uh, but it, it's definitely important because if we have, you know, anti-stealth technologies, anti-invisibility technologies, or other other types of technologies, um, which I know a few like quantum radar, for example, um, or other types, which are in their infancy, supposedly, um, even though that China seems to be using them to, to detect our stealth aircraft uh, quite effectively. Um, I've heard mixed rumors on why the U.S. isn't wor uh, using them anymore. Um, but, yeah, stuff like that it, it, it is important. I think, you know, Galileo Project and what Avi Loeb is doing is, is a step in that direction with better telescopes, better sensors, and better data better data collection, and, the, and the, also the outsourcing of that data to make sure that data is in the hands of academia and um, outside the influence of government from, and, you know, being able to censor or restrict or, or, or um, otherwise, you know, prevent the publication of that data. I think that's an important step. But um, also the fact that, you know, people can out there can start doing this on their own. There's there's uh, Sky Labs and other other um, setups for people, you know, to, to have in, in high UFO hotspots to, you know, set up these, you know, constant watch cameras and, and also stations for monitoring and taking other data such as, you know, atmospheric weather conditions, you know, other, other stuff. Because data is super important for solving a case. You know, half, half the trouble is usually finding out where the footage was taken, which direction, you know, getting the scope of, of the area and then figuring out what's going on in that area and whatnot. So so this data is super important to solving cases. And I, and I think that the more sensors, the more types of data, the more frequencies that we're looking at in, in terms of uh, what these things are doing when they're operating, the more those that type of additional information will tell us uh, about what we're seeing and what, what we're actually witnessing. Um, so yeah, I just want to mention that. And, uh, and then also, um, we talked about Battelle, and we said we were going to come back to that a little bit. Um, I also wanted to throw in BAE and uh, Marconi systems because uh, apparently Marconi w is an interesting ca uh, candidate for, you know, um, a company that would have had this over in the UK because the UK, of course, has its has Porton Down. That's Area Fifty One uh, for the UK, and, and you know, supposedly, if the US has an organization like Battelle that would have been a you know an organization which would have scooped up these technologies and worked on that kind of stuff. Uh, the UK, of course, has Marconi Systems, and Marconi Systems uh, ha have been involved in a number of you know classified research uh, 
you know, experiments and stuff over the years. But I always, I'd found out about this, uh, I think about a year ago or so, the Marconi scientist death conspiracy. Apparently there were over 20 scientists that worked for Marconi that died under very mysterious conditions. What? Um, yeah, it, it apparently like, you know, one guy told his wife that he, that he had discovered free energy and that he was working on it for the company and that they were all going to be rich and, and that it was going to change the world and all this stuff. And then he got it, um, he had to go out to the same town for a business meeting and his car got run off the road in the same town that all, a number of these other scientists were told to go to meetings at and they all died. Um, it's a very weird case. And, um, is there, is there any way that people can kind of look into that a little bit and find out? Yeah, just look up Marconi scientist death conspiracy. Uh, you'll find all kinds of links and, and articles and stuff and information wow. on it. Uh, it's not very widely known or talked about surprisingly, but you know, all the things I look up with, uh, these scientists and conspiracies revolving around scientists who may or may not have been involved in these types of projects and, and, and stuff. That one was certainly, uh, raised an eyebrow. Yeah. Well, well, um, you, you, you mentioned, yeah, again, you mentioned Patel. Uh, so before we, before we wrap up, if there's anything that you want to kind of highlight, uh, that we haven't spoken about yet with Patel, cause <laughs> I remember, I remember like a, a while ago when you were like, you know, you're not looking into Patel, you, you know, you were saying to me, you know, you need to look into this stuff. And I was like, I do, I am aware of Patel. I just haven't gone too deep into it. So like, if there is anything well, you want to kind just, of highlight. That's the whole thing is is everyone's being told to look at that Wilson memo that the right Wilson, right this, that's being touted as the big you know oh this is this is the red herring I think smoking it's, gun the smoking gun that's yeah the smoking gun they want you to follow and I think that's I don't know that's my personal belief uh, you know of course uh, that that they they're wanting us to follow that Wilson Davis memo but I think the real thing's been locked up in Battelle since the 50s you know or, or the organizations like it um and and they're just trying to you know distract you or attention elsewhere or barking up the wrong tree so to speak cuz uh that that whole thing is based on you know it's D D Eric Davis wrote down notes about an alleged conversation that he had with uh, this this colonel and that's I don't know I just yeah, well, my until it, you know, and and, and I, it, it, Hal Putoff testified. He was one of those six guys to testify to to that to that hearing. Um, uh, one of the six whistleblowers. So I assume if he testified, Eric Davis has got to be one of the other ones, right? And yeah, it, just, it only makes sense. So if Eric Davis and and Hal Putoff have testified, you know, um, who knows? Is this is this is this going to lead us to some real programs and some real disclosure? I, I hope so. That that would be great. Uh, one thing, I, one thing I will say about the Wilson dogs, because I agree with you, and like I've had my own kind of like suspicions of like you know, this kind of like you know their little cooked up thing that they want to use to push through, and you know maybe the ends justify the means. It might not be entirely accurate, but one thing I will say. And, uh, and I, you know, I will, uh, I will give myself a little pat on the back for this is I flew out to Florida and I met Oak Shannon. I, I, I got in contact yeah. with Oak Shannon and he is a, he's a, he's a good man, dude. Like he does not want to be in this. He's not looking for clout. He wasn't all kind of braggadocious at, at the meeting. He was very humble. He's a born again, Christian, you know, he was, you know, former special projects manager for Los Alamos. And um, and he said that Admiral Wilson called him up. He called him up and asked about the credibility of Eric Davis and, and kind of wanted him to, to vouch for Eric Davis. Um, and that's in the notes that he said, you know, I called Oak Shannon, big fan of Oak Shannon, and he vouched for you. Admiral talking to Eric, you know, he vouched for you. It's a shame he can't be with us, but he has, uh, you know, heart issues right now. And, and Linda, his wife, is taking his calls. Now, Linda is his wife and he did have heart issues. He died on the operating table at this time. So that's the, that's one thing where I would go, right, outside of just Eric and Hal and like this kind of aviary group, um, you've got this other dude who's who's confirmed that, you know, yeah, the Admiral did call him and he knows the Admiral. And, and I, I just think that there may be more to this. I do totally understand your your kind of skeptic uh, skeptical lens with it and like, you know, what exactly is happening here. But I think there is something to it. And I think that, you know, it might be that this is the best thing they have to try and set up this mechanism for the whistleblowers i mean you got to remember like gary 
Gary Nolan was the guy that asked Mike Gallagher to to bring up the Wilson documents to the two Pentagon officials during that that hearing. Um, it feels like they're kind of, um, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to think of the right term, but it, it kind of feels like they're using this as the explanatory framework through which things like the whistleblower testimony or the protection acts can kind of be put through. Um, and I think there's more in the it's more likely legit camp than there is in the it's a fake script made up thing camp it definitely feels like the needle's pointing more towards that although it's obviously not 100 percent confirmed and we i guess have to wait for admiral wilson to come out and say yes eric davis did come and speak to me and we did have this conversation which i imagine would only ever happen if he had absolute assurity that things were going to be okay and one thing i'll quickly say uh, which has been brought up uh, by people like Ross Coltart and a few others, is that as good as this um, whistleblower kind of protection act sounds, it won't protect you from professional uh, blowback. It won't protect you from, you know, your son or your other family members from being hired in the intelligence community or, you know, progressing their career. That that can still have extremely detrimental effects for you, your family, doesn't have to be that you're sent off to a black site to have your fingernails ripped out it could just be that you have really bad consequences now for your own you know your own personal professional life and and uh for that of your family so i would say that as as good as it sounds this kind of whistleblower stuff and it's important that we try and set up some form of legislation to protect people who do have intelligence they need to share it's not the be all and end all to protecting these people and there should probably still be a, a sufficient amount of leniency in these people to come out because they're probably worried about other ramifications so yeah i, I agree uh, you know the hyper focus on the wilson documents is something that has kind of activated the skepticism in me but you know some of the other data points have kept me interested in it and i think there's there's more to it than just simply a, a piece of paper with some writing on it you know well, I think the thing I thought was interesting is the Wilsons were brought up as being this uh, family that was central to the Sonora Aero Club and and uh, sort of as in Walter Bosley's theory of the, all this is that basically these exotic technology experimental groups are these uh, teams of you know wealthy you know millionaires that would get together and try to design and build exotic aircrafts and stuff. Um, were centered around these Will, these two Wilson brothers, uh, and Interesting. that they've kept this sort of UFO file in this Wilson family. Um, that it's it's a family that's sort of intertwined, and they and they keep they keep their own people. So it's a, it's only certain family members. So it's it's always something that you're inheriting from your father. Yeah. The same family's involved in it, so that way it's it's a business. Well. So their businesses are reliant on this the subject so the son won't be willing to call out or, or expose the thing because the it's, it's father and the family uh, business is all based around around uh keeping the secret mm. so it's this uh some rumors and speculation for the incentives of, of how these things are actually you know kept secret in the, uh, on yeah that's that's interesting because I knew about the Sonora Aero Club. I just didn't know that there was a connection to the Will. Is it is it actually been verified that that's the Wilson family, Admiral Wilson's? I I'm not I'm not sure, but that we were trying to look that up and and try to clarify that and, and get some you know lineage and history on mm -hmm. that. It's interesting that he has the the last name Wilson, and I was trying to figure out if he were was or was not connected with the same family. Cause if if he was, that would would certainly be uh, yeah, dude revelation but that would be weird that would be weird isn't tr isn't trump mentioned in sonora era club there's like a few uh drawings of those weird schematics they have in the sonora era club you, and there's the uh, trump 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 written all over some of them i had never heard that before yeah no i swear there is uncle that um took all the tesla files there wasn't it yeah because he had the mit uncle who was actually a very bright guy right so yeah he he assessed all of the the doctors recovered from tesla as to which ones had value or not so i mean surely that would have influenced him and the family i mean yeah it's interesting man it's interesting it's hard to know it's hard to know what exactly is known by these people right the one thing i say i mean i just just quickly um, an aside because i'm very skeptical of the stories of yeah the, the military related craft recovery stories yeah all you know, personally i'm very skeptical of those stories but some of them made more open to the idea of recovery and reverse engineering 
is the interstellar objects field because you know it's becoming kind of clear that there's a lot of these you know there, there was a recent study and they calculate we should have some based on the known number we have now i think it's a four or five that there's probably something like seven interstellar objects that pass through the inner solar system every year for the last 4.5 billion years so whatever these various objects are they're coming from other solar systems now so if you think about that that's billions of objects that have come from other solar systems so even if a very small proportion of that is space junk from other civilizations we should have had rain downs of derelict probes crafts you know satellites things that have just drifted here from deep space so you start saying well hang on a minute we don't need some of these maybe more fantastical tales to be open to the idea that at some point an alien probe just rained down somewhere yeah. and it's yeah. been called in and they've realized that either it's just the metal or the power system or something from that. So this starts to be a realistic scenario where you could think, well, yeah, this is should have happened because if there's billions of these things drifting around and we now know, you know, 10 years ago, people thought there was none. Now we're thinking there's been billions then I think it's very likely that in archaeological settings, people have found objects from interstellar space and that they may well have recovered some number of these derelicts that have rained out. That's where I'm kind of at with it. I think that we're going to see that this interstellar um, study that's starting to open up is probably the direction where we're going to find evidence of alien technologies, that they've been flowing past us or breaking up in the atmosphere. And nobody's really understood that they were there until now. So I just think that's going to change yeah. the way we think about this topic. Well, that make that you know that's always made a lot more sense to me. And to be fair, you know, one of the one of the kind of skeptical uh, perspectives on crash retrieval, reverse engineering, which I completely agree with, is wait a minute. So you're saying these are hyper advanced interstellar, transdimensional, you know, uh, platforms, but they're crashing. They're crashing yeah. their vehicles, shooting them down with like machine. Yeah, and, uh, you know, shooting them down like these these apes on planet planet, you know monkey land are shooting these incredibly advanced uh, craft down no it makes a lot more sense to me that it could be an archaeological discovery like you said or something like that jeremy you look like you want to uh, add something there yeah i always show the picture of the uh cessna that they flew over that tribal island of uh, right right where the cargo cult got started it's like trying they're all trying to shoot shoot down the airplane with arrows it's stuck full of air <laughs> we could just shoot yeah. down these ufos with our Michigan. Yeah. I mean, unless, unless, of course, you know the, the the hidden Tesla patterns, electromagnetic weapon systems that we have no idea about that could maybe disengage some form of you know space time bubble. Again, kind of goes back to the whole thing of here's a guy who's not a physicist just saying a bunch of waffle. Basically, it's just like here's me going, well, it could be some electromagnetic weapon, but we need people to actually truly be able to verify that kind of stuff, and and we're all kind of just guessing and. Uh, you know, making assumptions about how it could have happened, but I certainly don't find it likely that a hyper advanced intelligent species would be crashing. I do also think that there's a potential that it could be some form of technological breadcrumbs that it's not crashing. They're literally leaving them for us to kind of discover and figure out and piece the pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, but either archaeological or or breadcrumbs make a lot more sense than like, oh shit, we've crashed our flying saucer into planet Earth. Particularly yeah, yeah. because I think a lot of these encounters are visionary in nature. So, I mean, I know a lot of people don't like that, but a lot of them seem to be more to do with the brain function of human beings than to do with real... Otherwise, you have to look at it, look at what Keel showed us. I mean, there's always, as you said, there's like a, a craft and a creature for every one of us. There's so many of these accounts where there was, you know, the four-armed creature, the robot, that it, in the end, they can't all be real and visiting no. us. No. So, obviously, some large proportion of this is something to do with it may be technological, but it's happening in the mind, right? So whether that's a hacking technology that is projecting, whatever it is, I'm saying, I don't think many of these landings and crashes and stuff that people think they saw have objectively happened. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can have an experience. I don't think there's any physical aspect where you can go find a craft to that. But I do think that we may well have had, you know, that those could be technological, don't get me wrong, because I do think brain hacking and stuff like that is going on. And I do think an alien technology could do that, right? But I find it easier to accept that a probe has come down or that we've recovered a crashed craft, a derelict, or, you know, than this idea yeah, that we're shooting down all these crafts. Was it someone said the idea of like 400 craft crash stories or something now? That's a lot, you know, to say there's been like 400 of these crafts taken down. I mean, it starts, it was something like some wild figure. I mean, that's really hard to believe, isn't it? They were just 
almost like gunning these things down every week and you know something's not right in that story well i just wanted to point out um in addition to that sorry i lost my train of thought now that you're talking about this because i <sighs> don't worry think about it i can always cut i can always cut so just take a moment and think about it i, I know i just lost it completely ah oh, sorry um... oh i i feel i feel sorry for you because i saw you go like ah like, like you wanted to say something but this is the problem with like three it's it's always difficult to kind of but well, i think we've done very well so far uh, it's on the takedowns was it jeremy or takedowns crush retrieval oh yeah so no i just definitely want to point out yeah that if um i think that if the roman catholic church had come across any sort of uh unexplainable relic uh anomaly in in the archaeological record that it wouldn't have seen the light of day either uh, uh, that's a whole other rabbit hole right there the secret yeah. vatican archives and <laughs> what they might have um yeah so you have to think about that uh, about prehistory and, and and pre you know u.s military um in ancient history that a lot of the stuff's probably already been you know scouted out or or, or, or scraped off the landscape um we might find some stuff and you know hidden at the bottom of a lake bed or a stream we'd probably be better off looking or you know the, the the farmer who plows something up in his field but you know where are these artifacts and objects and anomalies you know and uh why aren't we seeing more of these you know sort of turned over to universities or, or showing up in the record anywhere it, it, it that's sort of a very curious argument to you know mm -hmm. as you oh the the frequency of space debris that ought to be coming by here and 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 hitting the earth whether you know from extraterrestrial mining operations or what have you there's yeah. industrial waste yeah that's floating around out there ready to land and and uh so yeah it's it's a good point um i think it's i think maybe more probes in space because uh looking and catching these things floating by would be a lot better than catching the burned up remnants of what we ever fall, has fallen recovered from what's yeah. altered um you know so i it, it's it's uh again yeah we need better sensors better technology and also you know better telescopes and stuff so it's... but i mean just to follow you there I do, I do think you know jeremy it's a really good point i mean yeah why aren't we seeing like scientists and people you know again this stuff took to them you know because you find you know average person finds an extraordinary thing take it to the museum or they take it to someone you know they think would know what it is you know you'd think some of these things would filter through so there, there's definitely something strange in that story because if there is as many of these objects both in terms of like i said the science of interstellar objects that they're suggesting and all these takedowns and crashes and stuff you would definitely expect some artifacts yeah by now to have got through you know any military interest and have made it to the public and there's definitely a, a severe lack considering well, the number of objects should be there this is this is kind of going back to what you said a lot earlier about how people see like within the ufo community seem to kind of close off the ufo issue and don't look at other power structures or potential kind of like elements in the global scheme that might connect to it and so i mean there's a you know there's um, certainly there's a rabbit hole to be um explored with like the smithsonian and you know the vatican and these things might have genuine artifacts that have been covered up i mean i haven't gone deep enough into it but people swear blind that you should look into giants and giant bones and you know the smithsonian has claimed to have like covered up giant bones and i'm just saying like you know there there is certainly other institutions that would appear at face value to be separate from technology or you know reverse engineering or black budget but may have some of the same things that these people want to study and there may be secret collaborations between some of these more powerful institutions that have uh you know global influence over what's discovered and what's not discovered and what's said and what's not said and um, you know i'm having uh diana pasolka on soon and we're going to get into the kind of vatican archives and things like that because that's another element of this where i think you know why does this this church have vast vast archives that are completely hidden off i mean they are like the original intelligence community the vatican church i would say that they're like the original intelligence gathering you think about i'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here but i'll try and reel it in but it's a thought i want to get out is that you think about like you know the, the fact that back in back in the good old days medieval and beyond the church was the center of the town 
and what would you do? You'd go to confession. They're basically gathering intel on all of the people in the in the village, and they have you know kind of uh, leverage over you. So this is like the original uh, IC, the the Vatican, very powerful, um, and they have you know incredible incredible volumes of sequestered information whether this be documentation or artifacts and uh, and you only get access to the vatican archives through a very specific you know if you're a scholar in a specific discipline you can kind of uh, request access to what's in your discipline you can never request access to the full the full spectrum you can't so it works like a compartmented special access program in in, in that respect and i think there's a lot to be said about um, you know, the Vatican's involvement. I mean, the, the Pope of late has kind of been saying things like, if there are intelligences out there, then they're brothers and sisters, they're children of God as well, almost as if there is some level of preparatory uh, kind of process for the uh, for the flock of the religious community so they don't lose their shit when they realize that we're not the center of the universe and there are other intelligences. So yeah, I think, you know, this is where you have to expand your aperture from beyond just simply... The kind of you know reverse engineering and black budget and go well what about these other institutions and what kind of impact have they had historically not even just with ufos but just in terms of the objective history of humanity do we know our own history or is most of it actually secreted away and what would change if we knew what was in these halls and in these corridors and in these dusty dark little labyrinths within things like the vatican so yeah probably another uh, another conversation uh, to have at a later time, and um, you know, I've re I, honestly, I've really enjoyed this. I think people are very quickly though. I know we'll be, we'll be yeah. told off if we don't mention. Of course, there are these metal fragments that people do find. Yes, in and you know, obviously, there's analysis suggesting at least some of these are interesting. But um, yeah, what we don't see is you know large objects, you know, technologies, anomalies in that way. No. We, we have to say that okay, there are pieces of metal that seem extraordinary in their composition it seems now i mean, obviously haven't seen a lot of that data i've seen little bits like probably you guys i've seen some of the presentations of like the uber tuba material and stuff like that. so it does seem like maybe small fragments of strange things have been found whether those are bits of alien probes that broke up or so but yeah what we're lacking is large objects that would look definitively alien technology you know what we instead get is metals that have strange composition you know small pieces so far yeah Anything to add, Jeremy? No, man, this was a great conversation. And uh, yeah. thank you for inviting me and joining. People can find me on alienscientist.com or at alien underbar Twitter. Alien underbar scientist on Twitter. Sorry. No no worries. No, I agree. This is this has been really good. I really enjoyed it. I think people are going to enjoy this talk. Um, you know, I would encourage everyone listening to follow Bruce and Jeremy on their socials and via their uh, particular platforms which will all be linked in the description box below and uh, of course if you enjoyed this talk then uh, please don't forget to like the video drop a comment below if you haven't done so already uh, and hit subscribe and the notification button as well you know it all it all helps in the uh, in the battle against the algorithm which is certainly a very real battle and is becoming a bit more prominent in this day and age so it really does help and uh yeah, let's, uh, let's keep trying to push this ball forward in the various ways in which we feel we should. Um, you know, until next time, gentlemen, I just want to say thank you. And, and again, for your input and for your, your continued energy within this subject. You're both greatly appreciated. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah.